My name is Mae Gerstel. We want to thank you very much for joining us this evening. This is our second in-person candidate forum since 2019. It is sponsored by the Residence Council Elections Forum Committee in order to help us be more informed voters. We are strictly nonpartisan and we always welcome new members. If you would like to join our committee, please contact Laura Weiss. Laura, can you raise your hand? Wherever you are. Over there. If you're interested in joining the committee, just ask Laura and she will be delighted to have you join us. Yes, sorry, our, I'm way back here. Hi. <laughs> our question subcommittee are headed up by Doris Ray and she has prepared a list of questions that will be asked of all the candidates after their introduction. Now I'm delighted to welcome the three candidates for the King County Council. It's position number eight, that's our district. After we've heard from all of them, you will hear from the two candidates who are running for the court commission. There is a third candidate, however, he could not be with us this evening. But first, before you meet them, what does the county do for us city residents? Well, the, city, the King County Council sets policies, enacts laws, adopts the county budget, and provides oversight to county services. The services that the county provides includes assessing the value of real property, collecting property taxes, promoting public health, and providing social services to those who cannot afford them. These, they are all, they are the owners and operators of the King County Metro Transit System. King County government is also responsible for the Superior and the District Courts and the county jail. And of course, they conduct the King County elections. We elect one person in our electoral district, that's District 8, and they're elected for four years. Their salary is $172,789 a year. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce a seasoned moderator who I've known for many years, Barbara Spaeth. Okay. Now the ground rules tonight, and this is for the benefit of both candidates and the audience, are two minutes for opening statements. Oh, I'm too short for this. <laughs> the ground rules will involve two-minute opening statements for each candidate, and they will be in starting off in alphabetical order. I'll do a rotation so no one ends up with being in the same position for every question. Two minutes for opening statements, three minutes for their closing statement, and they'll be doing that from the podium and questions will be for one minute. Okay. Ooh. <laughs> All good. You just, for those who didn't hear it, two minute opening statements, one minute questions, and three minutes for a closing statement. We want to thank candidates for adhering to our timers in the front row to make sure everyone has the chance to be heard. A yellow warning sign, which Adele waved at you, and then, of course, the red flame for time to quit. We'll begin with section, with the two-minute opening statement section in uh, responding to a question I sent to the each candidate. Please tell us why you are a candidate for King County Council what are your goals and emphasis for this position, and how do you plan to accomplish those goals? And we'll start off with Sophia Aragon. 
thank you so much. Can everybody hear me? Okay. So my name is Sophia Aragon, and I'm the mayor of the city of Burien. And I'm running for King County Council because I want all county residents to thrive. And so this makes sure that King County is a safe, healthy, and inclusive place where families can call home for a lifetime and businesses can take root. So I actually grew up in South Seattle, and my mom single-handedly supported our family of four with a union job. She had living wages, and she had great health care. And so our parents moved us out to unincorporated King County for affordable housing, which is a large part of the district as well, where they wanted a safe neighborhood and good public schools for their two girls. So in terms of my goals, is one is common sense public safety measures. I hope to use my experience in nursing workforce development to improve um, our public safety workforce. I know it's been recognized that there's been a shortage for many years, but we're in pretty severe shortage territory right now, and that is something I would like to work on. I know that also in that field of work, there's lots of room for improvement, um, and that's something that I work on every day in nursing as our um, healthcare system still creates a lot of disparities for our patients, and so I think I can bring that quality improvement also to law enforcement. The other piece too, as a mayor of the city, I've been really had up close and personal experience with affordable housing and also homelessness. So with affordable housing, um, I know we put together a number of models that are available to our community, but the homelessness issue has really changed um, in the last four years. And again, I wanna bring my nursing experience to really meet head on the challenges we have with mental health and substance use that is closely interacting with homelessness and drives that issue. And lastly, a healthy environment. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Good Space Guy. I think we live in a pretty wonderful country. Can you come to the microphone close to your mouth, please? Right by my mouth. Is that it? Yes. I think we live in a very nice country. Our ancestors were wise in the country they gave us with the government at all various levels. Anyone who's interested can uh, register the vote and then vote to select their leaders or to become their leaders. So anyone who's interested can, uh, can file as a candidate and introduce their, uh, their ideas to the public. Now when I look around King County, I'm rather pleased, but we have a problem called the homeless. So there's a lot of people who are not working that uh, I'd like to make it easy for the homeless to get work I'd like to make it easy for the handicapped to get work. I don't like, like it when it's hard for people to get work. When, people, when it's easy for people to get work, then you have less shoplifting, less smuggings, less broken uh, windows on your cars, and it's safer to go around. And when everyone is working, places tend to be, uh, be uh, cleaner cleaner streets. I uh, once went on vacation in London, England, when I was a student at Stockholm University in Sweden, and I was really impressed with how clean London looked at that time. And so when I think of the tourists who come to Seattle, I'd like them to have the same experience as when I went to uh, London. And uh, I uh, lived in Germany and Sweden. I learned my German in Sweden. Pardon me. I let my... Oh, I've got the red sign. Thank you. And Teresa, your turn. Well, good evening. Can you hear me? Yeah. Excellent. It's great to be back at the Horizon House. Thank you so much for having us. And thank you for hosting these well-informed debates. I can't count how many times I've been here in the last six years as I've run for office at Seattle City Council. 
and today I'm in front of you as a King County Council candidate. It's great to see friends like Don Mitchell, who I've worked with on workers' rights and health care for all. It's wonderful to be in the presence of Representative Armstrong. Thank you very much, Seth Armstrong, for all of your support over the years and for the work that you've done to support working families. I'm here today in front of you to ask for your support for King County Council. I have come to you before as a member of the Washington State Labor Council, AFL-CIO, when I first ran for Seattle City Council. I've come to you as an incumbent running for your support again because I've been able to show you that I've stood up and acted incredibly and thoughtfully but aggressively to try to create additional housing, worker support, small business investments, and security for those who want to retire in this city. I come to you now asking for your support for King County Council because the county is the place to be to invest in our health. The county is the place that has purview and the purse strings over investments in public health, behavioral health, substance abuse, domestic violence, elder abuse issues, the shadow pandemic that has only continued to worsen during the pandemic of COVID. And for me, what I would love to do is to be able to build on my track record of bringing people together, finding common ground, a commitment to the health and the well-being of our community, but doing so at the county so we can invest in the community's health. With your support at the county, I'll be able to invest directly into that shadow pandemic, invest in housing, invest in worker and retiree support, and create more walkable, livable, and affordable King County. Thank you for your consideration for hosting this yet again. Now we turn to the questions that have been submitted by residents. These were one minute answers. What criteria would you use to judge whether King County should renew its participation in the King County Regional Homelessness Authority when its initial five year term expires in December of 2024? Good space guy, you're first. Uh, homelessness is an immediate problem. A person is homeless, they need a place to shower. Today, not in five years, not in ten years. So we had our ten year plan, and our ten year plan to solve homelessness this came and went. There are some people that would like to bureaucratize the homeless problem and uh, develop institutions to take care of it. But uh, the help is needed now. We, we need to take care of our people now, not, not next year. The next the next response will be from Teresa. Thank you so much. So homelessness is mostly a housing crisis issue. And my interest has, on Seattle City Council has been investing in additional affordable housing. In fact, in my time in Seattle, we quadrupled the investments in affordable housing. And we know so much more is needed. In order for people to stay stably housed and get off the streets and come inside, they need access to care services. On Seattle City Council, I've invested in the human service care pay so that we can increase the pay so those who are caring for our seniors, our elders, our veterans, our youth who are struggling to find affordable housing and stay housed in this city can have access to those caregivers to keep them stably housed. But I have also been on the front lines of helping to create the Regional Homelessness Authority. Homelessness is not an issue that ends at Seattle's borders. It's not an issue that ends at any of our city or jurisdiction borders. And that's why I will continue to be your champion on standing up the Regional Homelessness Authority. I have the support of the Chief of Staff from RHA, and I will continue to see that through to make sure that it is successful. Now, so and now, Sophia. Thank you very much. So as a uh, mayor of a city that is handling the homelessness crisis, and I know that the city of Seattle does as well, that I, it occurred to me that while we are a city that invested a lot in 
many models of affordable housing from mixed rate market rate low income, Habitat for Humanity, so permanent supportive housing, the first DESC outside of Seattle, and then Eco Thrive, which are environmentally sensitive low income um, cottages. What occurs to me in terms of our lack of ability to help those who are homeless is this very first rung of the ladder which is adequate emergency housing. And I would like to see emergency housing that is closely tied to substance use and mental health issues so that people have a place to go and have that clarity of mind to make those voluntary decisions that we require them to do to get into further housing. So I think that is a gap that I would like to work with the Regional Homelessness Authority about. And the other piece too is that, and I've talked about substance use, is that there's a preventative issue that needs to be addressed as well. It looks like I'm out of time, so, but I think I've given you my main points. Thank you. Next question is, what steps would you advocate to better achieve a lasting reduction of homelessness in our community? First responder will be Teresa. Thank you. Thank you. Check, check. Okay. Thank you so much for the question. The answer to long-term solutions to homelessness is investments in long-term affordable housing and supportive housing. I have the support of nurses from SEIU 1199 who work within Downtown Emergency Services Center because they have seen me invest in the wages of the Downtown Emergency Service Center and the human service providers. Folks who work with our elders and our youth from youth care. Folks who have seen what it takes to get people inside and keep them stably housed. At King County, I want to continue this commitment to investing in those frontline workers, the first folks who can help people stay stably housed. Yes, I will be there to build a brick and mortar, to create the roof and the doors, to make sure that people can come inside. But in order to keep people stably housed, we have to have the workforce. That is why I have the endorsement of every single local union who has endorsed, and the nurses and the firefighters. Firefighters Local 27 have told me, every time we call, we get called for a call that is non-emergency related, people need a landing zone, there's no place to take them, they've invested in me because I know we will get a place for people to go to. Sophia. Thank you. Lasting reduction in the homelessness. So, I've, I have supported all of the measures that the city and the county have done so far. As for example, the crisis mental health centers, because we don't have a place for people to go, no questions asked to get the treatment they needed. But what the gap I see is that we wait for people to get sick. We wait for people to get tangled up in that chronic disease of substance use. And what I would like to see is some prevention. When I was growing up, I saw a lot more education in terms of what drugs were, why were they harmful, and why people need to be really careful, and especially children, as to why they need to stay away from them. So that's one component that I would definitely add. And I also agree that long-term affordable and supportive housing definitely needs to speed up. We at the City of Burien have a goal of 7,000. City of Seattle, it will be much more higher. Um, but I've seen also that if with these different models, that mixed market rate and affordable housing, it's much more readily available. So I think that's what I would do to counter the homelessness issue today. Finally, good space guy. Uh, to decrease homelessness, we need to address the causes of homelessness. Uh, some people say it's caused by drugs. Some people uh, say it's caused by the minimum wage. Many people support the minimum wage. Now, I, I, I'm an amateur astronomer and an amateur economist and an amateur many other things. I use the word amateur as a lover of these subjects. So I'm a lover of economics, a lover of astronomy. Um, and uh, in economics, Economics has some of the answers of how we, we the people, should operate our economy. If the minimum wage makes jobs go away, that's not a good thing. So the claim is out there that the minimum wage makes low-paying jobs go away, and you see the homeless. The next question is, what hiring incentives would you suggest to eliminate 
the staffing shortages in the metro transit system. Good space, Guy. Uh, could you repeat that question, please? Sure. What steps, what hiring incentives would you suggest to eliminate the staffing shortages in the metro transit system? You know, the taxpayers have to pay a lot of, of their dollars for the public transportation system, apparently because a lot of users of the system don't want to pay their fares. So uh, if the uh, if the users don't pay their fare, it's a harder burden on the taxpayer. And uh, I'm a friend of the taxpayer. I'm a friend of small government. I think gov government is too bad, too big. And the private sector should be larger, and the public sector should be smaller. So I would want uh, fair collection enforced. Um, to get more money to the operation of the public transportation system. Teresa. Thank you so much for this question. I'm the, um, I'm the only candidate up here who has the endorsement of the Metro Transit Drivers. ATU, the Algamated Transit Union, has endorsed me. And they've endorsed me because I've heard on multiple fronts that not only do we need to make sure that we're investing in wages, and the ergonomic incentives that are necessary to keep people driving those buses, but we also need to be investing in the retention of workers. Not just thinking about how we draw in the next series of workers coming in, but how we invest in the current workforce there, and also making transit rider jobs lucrative for those who've been on the front line of the pandemic, mostly women, people of color, who've been out there during the pandemic on the front line putting their lives and their families' lives at risk. We need to be creating job recruitment opportunities to bring in women and people of color to this workforce, investing in the retention and the ergonomic needs of drivers. They've shown me phone books underneath their seats. That's not a way to make sure that people's health and safety is invested in. And finally, they said child care. They need access to child care to make sure that more people can come to that job. And finally, Sophia. Thank you. I certainly agree that Metro jobs need to have a living wage. That's a real challenge here in the Seattle area, which where we have a rising income gap. Um, and being in workforce development, wages is one important component. The other important component is the workplace conditions. You know, people like to stay at their work, not only because they're compensated well, but they feel like they can do their job safely. And be in an environment in which if they have to work long hours at a time, which I've Metro drivers certainly have to do, that that is something that Metro itself actually provides for, whatever that would be. And the other piece in terms of fares, you know, when I grew up, we had the free ride system in downtown. We don't have that anymore. I'm not against reduced or free fares, but we just have to be really clear about when that happens. We can give work cards, for example, if we want to give that as a benefit to people. But having this unclarity of maybe you have to pay, maybe you don't, to me, is hurting the system. What incentives should be employed to increase ridership on Metro Transit? And so there you're on again. Um, increasing ridership on Metro, I think that, um, well, first of all, I think riders also want a, good, a safe environment also, right, um, when they're riding the buses. When I was growing up, my grandmother immigrated to take care of me at the age of 55 from the Philippines, and often I was her little escort to go downtown with her to go window shopping, right? And um, that's something that I would hope that if she and I were as a pair today going to downtown, the same is true. Also, efficiency. We need to make sure that there are routes that service people um, that need to get to places where to go. So I remember one time being in a debate about Metro and a student stood up from South Seattle and they were like, I'm not really sure you're serious about investing in my education if you keep cutting our bus routes. So I think that we need to make sure that we keep track of those routes that are heavily used, make sure they're really efficient and not, in, not accidentally cut off people from, from bus routes that they really need because they don't have other transportation to rely on. Good space, Guy, you're next. People want to feel safe 
when they get on a bus or other, other transportation uh, vehicle. Um, when people don't pay their fare, they just get on the bus, that contributes to a lawless uh, atmosphere. So we need to enforce the collection of the fares. Uh, we need to have occasional security, uh, control the uh, system so they can step in and uh, arrest troublemakers so that the riders can feel safe. So we have to concentrate on making the public transportation system safe for the user. What has the <laughs> So sorry, I, I'm really excited about this question, so I wanted to jump in. Um, so how do we increase ridership for Metro and our regional transportation system? I'm going to give you three examples. One, I want to make sure that we're investing in routine and regular stops. Often we go to the bus stop and your time passes and the bus hasn't come. That's not a way to ensure that people will routinely ride the bus. If you need to get to your grocery store, your medical appointment, your daycare, your meal program, it is not okay if the bus doesn't come. So routine and regular pickups is number one. Number two, post-pandemic, I'm going to put that in quotes because I still have my mask up here. We know we still need to be careful. But what we have learned now is that there should no longer be a focus on high traffic times. We want people to access their medical appointments, their jobs at any time of day, and I want to see round-the-clock access to CARES or round-the-clock access to Metro so that people can ride it no matter what time of the day it is. And the third thing is safe transit. ATU has told me they want to see alternative response systems so that when there's a crisis, they can call someone other than 911. Next question is, what has the county done to address climate change and what additional steps, if any, do you propose? And Teresa, you're on <laughs> right now. Thank you. Thank you so much for this question. Um, I'm really proud as Seattle City Council to have led the charge on Jump Start's progressive payroll tax, which invested funding into the Green New Deal for Seattle, $40 million over this biennium in Green New Deal investments. I will continue that commitment on environmental justice at King County. Number one, I want to see our King County buildings be more environmentally sound. I led the efforts on this in Seattle to ensure that our city buildings were environmentally efficient. I want to do that across the county. Number two, every single place we can, we should be electrifying our fleets. I know this port has done a ton, ton of work on this, and I want to continue that work with our Metro fleet and all of our other vehicles that the county uses. Number three, I want to make sure that we are looking deep within our city to see how we should be investing into green buildings for our community, providing incentives, dollars, and grants to community partners so their buildings, their fleets can be environmentally sound as well. We can do all three of those at the county. Next, good speech, guy. Thank you. I want to keep the uh, burden on the taxpayer low. So I don't like all the programs designed for taxpayer to pay for this and taxpayer to pay for that. Now carbon, well, uh, climate change, the climate's always changing, but not significantly. The uh, climate of Earth is rather stable. Sometimes, some win winters or summers are uh, change slightly, but uh, carbon is very easy for nature to make. Carbon has an atomic number of nine, and hydrogen one, nitri uh, pardon, uh, oxygen one, nitrogen seven, and oxygen eight. So with these little numbers of the number of protons in the carbon atom, and that we say that life is carbon-based, my time is up. Sophia. Thank you. 
Um, well, so as we build more homes, it is really essential to make sure that they are built with that green technology, and that's something I definitely would like to incentivize. At the city of Buren, we passed one of the first um, climate action plans in the state, and with some funds that were available, we did have several choices. One was to electrify, and however, we came up with another idea given our population does have people who have been in their homes for a really long time and decided that it was best to benefit to provide some funding so that people can retrofit their home as appropriate because as we saw some data a lot of the carbon emissions actually also come from homes as well as the cars and the other piece I think is really important is to preserve green space so that so as an airport city we know that because we are I'm exposed to a number of emissions, and then so we're proud at the South Sound to work with the Port of Seattle and other communities to make sure there is that green space so that we can balance out the emissions and keep the clean air so that people can stay around and be healthy in the environment. Thank you. What can King County do to improve public safety in the cities and unincorporated areas. And Sophia, you're next. Um, public safety is one of my priorities, and I would look forward to use my workforce development to really apply that. So in nursing, we really know that if a job appears to not be valued by its users, that the workplace conditions are terrible, and third, you might actually risk your life doing your job, which is true with nurses, but you know what, it's also true with law enforcement. And those are the things that we can improve in terms of um, making expectations about how law enforcement um, how law enforcement does its job, um, and make sure that they know that they're they are still a needed part of our community. Local government that is our role. So in terms of law enforcement, the state's not going to provide it for us, although that they, they pass criminal code. Federal government is not going to provide that. It's really city and county. The other piece being a uh, being a mayor of a city dependent on the sheriff's office, which is run by the county, is just more fairly distribute the workforce. So that when we see areas in the county where we see that we need to have more response, that our officers go there. Teresa. Oh. Thank you so thank you so much. So I want to make sure at the county that we're investing in the traditional responders for public safety, being our sheriffs and our police, as well as upstream investments. We have learned over the last three years that with this crisis, pandemic, the shadow pandemic, mental health and substance abuse, behavioral health issues, they don't require an officer with a gun to, to show up. In fact, the firefighters who've endorsed me have said similar to what the first line uh, police officers have said, which is, we didn't sign up for this work to be housing connectors or crisis care managers or the people who should be tasked with behavioral health services. Instead, we need to be deploying community entities to be able to respond to those issues. That is why I have invested more funding into gun violence reduction strategies, mental health services, behavioral health services, domestic violence and elder abuse strategies to reduce violence and community safety issues on the front end, as well as support our police officers with every single dollar that the mayor and the chief have asked for in terms of hiring new officers to meet their goals. It is a both and approach. And the more we invest upstream, the less our officers have and firefighters have to respond to on the back end. Good space time. I'd like to give the security guards more authority. Uh, some security guards are just supposed to watch and observe rather than help. So I'd like the security guards to have more authority to actually help instead of just watch and observe. And the police are very expensive, and I'm trying to save the taxpayer money. So I'd like uh, the professional police to have a system assistance. When I was in, uh, many years ago, living in uh, Tacoma, Washington area, uh, I joined the U.S. Army Reserve Military Police, and we were very poorly paid. So I was thinking, these assistants can uh, be poorly paid like we in the uh, U.S. Army Ready Reserve work. The 
legislature recently passed a bill giving county councils the right to assess one-tenth of one percent sales tax to support cultural access programs, including music, theater, ballet, etc. Would you support adopting this tax for King County? Why or why not? Good space guy. Uh, can, can you repeat that question again? The legislature recently passed a bill giving county councils the right to assess a one-tenth of one percent sales tax to support cultural access programs such as music, theater, ballet, etc. Would you support adopting this tax for King County? Why or why not? I, I think I'd be opposed to that that uh, small contribution to the arts. The arts should be determined by the people. Uh, instead of transferring money from you, the taxpayers, to a government official to determine where, it, to which culture it will go, I prefer to uh, see the consumer determine where their money goes for entertainment or education. Uh, so I'd like to say no to that tax and yes to the consumer. Sophia. I think it's really challenging when we need to raise the funds in that sort of way. Um, sales taxes are very regressive and people with the least means often have to pay the most for even really basic needs. So because it's an optional tax, I would make sure that we have those community conversations and hear from the community, is that where you want the funding to go? Because unfortunately, that is the structure here statewide. Now, I also think it's important to work with the state legislature so we have more fair revenue systems um, for the systems that we really need. But on the other hand, when it comes to cultural access, it does improve quality of life for a lot of people. And there's also the opportunity for when you attract arts and culture into your community, um, that that is an opportunity to generate revenue um, within that jurisdiction. So that's something that the community should consider, but the county really needs to engage in a dialogue with you all as to whether you want your money to go there. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. You know, I, I appreciate this question, and I think that it's great that the state legislature gave the county this additional authority. I think it's great because as we come out of the pandemic, the thing that makes us healthy is community cohesion. The thing that makes our community and our local economy healthy is activity and activation. Investing in arts and culture is not only good for the artists, and the creative culture of our community. It's good for our health. It's good for population health when we all have a chance to go out and enjoy. Our city, our county, our state, we are in one of the most regressive places in the entire country when it comes to taxation. But I want to applaud the state legislature for giving the county that tool. I would want to act quickly to deploy those dollars because it is good for our health when we invest in arts and culture. And I have led on progressive revenue, you know that, from Jumpstart Progressive Payroll Tax. And I will work with our state legislature on things like a progressive real estate excise tax so we have more tools at our disposal going forward. Okay, do you support King County's draft long-range plan to achieve decarbonization? Why or why not? And Teresa, you're up. Yes, yes, I support our long-range plan to, de to, um, to invest in the decarbonization of our community and our infrastructure. Single-use occupancy vehicles are the number one contributor to carbon emissions in our region. Carbon emissions coming from single occupancy vehicles can be reduced when we invest in metro and transit, when we invest in reliable buses, and we expand our um, light rail system. When we invest in the last mile, whether it's by using those metro vans to get us to the bus station or increasing access and the frequency of buses and light rail to come into more areas of our neighborhood. This is the most pressing issue in our community and I know you all are desperately feeling this like I am. 
I have a three-year-old, and from the across the entire age spectrum, there is nothing more concerning for our health than the crisis of global warming. That is why I'm so committed to this issue, and we'll actively work on it with you. Good space, guy. I, uh, good space guy, love carbon. <laughs> carbon, <clears throat> atomic number not, uh, pardon me, atomic number six means there's six uh, protons in the, nu in the nucleus of the atom. And it's so abundant in the universe that a war on carbon is a war on, un on the universe. Uh, it's said that life on Earth is carbon-based. So to declare a taxpayer war on carbon is to declare a war on life. And on uh, uh, the easy way. So nature makes so much carbon uh, because it's so easy to make. So let's uh, leave here thinking, carbon good, carbon good. Sophia. I certainly support decarbonization. Um, expanding light rail is a great idea. Um, we certainly wanted it more in our region. I think that we need to be thoughtful around the variety of communities that make up King County, particularly this district, and make sure that there's equitable access to these modes of transportation. Um, because the reality is, People who, a lot of people who work in Seattle, they live in communities like mine. So if we're going to incentivize the public transit, make sure that it's equitably provided to all the communities, in other words, suburbs, like the city of Burien, um, so that people can get back and forth, and also make it a comfortable and safe experience for people so that they actually enjoy the experience um, instead of getting into your own car and fighting with parking up here. Well, I'm watching the clock, and we don't want to shortchange our poor candidates. So it's now time for our closing statements, and those will be for three minutes each. And the first person who will be asked to do that is Good Space Guy. It's uh, fun to be up here between two capable attract women. I love women. Uh, I recommend that you run for office if you're interested. It's very educational running for elected, elected office. Um, we live in a country where our government is formed by us who are interested. When you uh, decide who you're going to support. Uh, you're helping to form the government. And there's so many la layers of government. Federal, state, county, city, school board, various utilities, sewer, commission, fire. Uh, we live in a government of the masses rather than a dictatorship. So dictators, I, I once visited East Germany when it was co communist. I had a vacation there. And uh, there's so much that the planners mix. So I'm, I'm against the planned economy, the command economy. I'm against the economy of the minimum wage. There's a concept in economics called the invisible hand. And the invisible hand um, works to adjust the economy to the levels that you, the consumer, want. And in the communist countries, for example, in East Germany and East Berlin, I, I mainly saw East Berlin and Dresden, uh, things get out of balance when the adjustment process is left to the uh, planners. So uh, the invisible hand of the free market leads to the highest living standard. And when we don't mess with, when we don't allow our government to interfere with the management 
of the businesses, we get uh, better products for our consumers and uh, things just go better. So in, uh, in East Germany, so many fled, people fled East Germany and went to the command, to the competitive economy of West Germany that East Germany was sort of empty. So I thought to myself, East Germany is really a nice, relaxing vacation destination if you like camping, etc. Thank you. And now it's Teresa's turn. Well, I want to thank all of you once again for this conversation tonight, for all the organizers of tonight's event, and for having this informed conversation. I know that you take your time to read all of the material, and I greatly appreciate that. You can find more information about me at teamteresa.org. You can see our priorities and our endorsements at teamteresa.org. But well, let me just conclude with a few examples of why people are supporting me in this race for King County Council. Governor Inslee has supported me in this race and has endorsed because of our long-standing track record of trying to expand access to health care, health care for all kiddos. He appointed me to the exchange board when the Affordable Care Act went into place. My long-standing track record of fighting for health care for all and trying to expand Medicare for all. I have the endorsement of Representative Jayapal because of the work that we've done collectively on improving access to working conditions and good living wage jobs for workers and retirement security investing in child care and in health care. Representative Jayapal sees in me someone who's progressive and effective. I have the endorsement of Bob Ferguson because we have collectively worked together on reducing gun violence and addressing community safety and holding large corporations accountable. I have the support of the King County Democrats and every single legislative district Democrats who have endorsed in this race because that they, they know I am true Lee, a progressive Democrat, but I will work with people to find that common ground. On King County Council, I have the opportunity to work with the six sitting King County Council members and Executive Dow Constantine who have endorsed me in this race to find regional solutions to these most pressing crises. Health, housing, and working family supports. With your support, I will invest in our community health not only addressing our direct individual health, but investing in our population health by investing directly in the shadow pandemic, behavioral health, substance abuse issues, um, interpersonal violence, gun violence. I will help reduce these issues that are plaguing our community as well as invest in housing. I have led on housing at Seattle City Council. I will lead on housing at the county and invest in affordable housing for working families, retirees, and young folks across this region. And finally, I have the endorsement of every single labor union who has endorsed in this race. The King County Labor Council, Martin Luther King County Labor Council, they have endorsed me along with every affiliate, including the nurses and the firefighters, because they know that I will invest in living wage jobs for our region. At the county, of course, but also creating economic opportunity for folks in the private sector. With your support, we can tackle these crises, address housing, health, and worker supports, and create greater economic shared prosperity for everyone. Thank you for your consideration. Finally, Sophia, your turn. Thank you so much, and I really enjoyed my time being here and sharing with you all all of the work that I hope to pursue when I'm at the King County Council. So nursing taught me to be an advocate for others, and I decided to step up that skill and become a lawyer to shape and develop public policy. So in Olympia, I advocated for workplace safety, health care for all when the ACA was at the debate, and getting toxics out of the environment. Because strong public policy creates opportunity, and I want to create those conditions where everyone has a chance to succeed. And aging in place is important. I remember as an immigrant child with my family, my mom was the only person who could work, and she was able to buy us a four-bedroom home in South Seattle um, with her her uh, licensed practical nurse um, salary, which was pretty modest. 
And if today, well actually maybe five years ago, I haven't checked what the availability would be today, there would only be one low-income apartment complex in South Seattle where she can move in her family of four. So the choices are very grim, and I want to make sure that we have those same opportunities for future generations. And as mayor and as council member, I would I really value knowing that representation matters. So as a woman of color and an Asian immigrant, I took a stand on Asian hate, which continues to occur everywhere, and so we need to fight against hate wherever it is. I do support police and fire on a co-response model. In Burien, we do have social workers that are able to attend a mental health crisis, so it's not treated like a crime, but we can do better. In other cities, like neighboring cities like Kent, where they've been at this for years, we have nurses, social workers, and other healthcare providers because they know, based on the data from firefighters, that often it's a health issue that they're responding to and not necessarily fire or a crime. So we need more help in law enforcement and public safety in that area. And it's really important that the county have regular working collaboration with those communities that are outside the city of Seattle. So in Burien, I've had lots of experience like that. I think in unincorporated uh, places in the county, which this district includes, including Bashan Island and White Center, that they are equal partners at the table because we need everybody to work together to address affordable housing and homelessness. And I mentioned before, in terms of homelessness, just watching the issue over the last four years, Four, four, ten years ago, I was very reluctant to make too strong of a connection between substance use and homelessness. But that's not the fault of the homeless in that there is much more severe substance use out there. And as a registered nurse, I would like to address that. And also voting, supporting small businesses, expanding child care and apprenticeships that lead to careers are those in conditions so people will be successful. So my focus is common sense public safety measures, adequate police and a healthy environment, and affordable housing for all so that we can all continue to prosper. Thank you. And I thank you candidates for joining us and for your contribution. is going to introduce us to the Court Commission and the candidates. By the way, you're welcome to stay or leave as you <laughs> choose. The Port of Seattle is a separate entity that covers King County. The commissioners are also elected by district for a four-year term. Their duty is to oversee operations and management, to equip and maintain the port, and to establish port policies that impact the Maritime Port and SeaTac Airport. Their salary is $57,867 plus a per diem. It is a part-time position. Now Barbara will ask the questions. Well again, you'll have two minutes for opening statements and three minutes for closing statements and there will be one minute answers to questions. And again, we've sent the candidates a general question which we would like you to address in your opening statement. Please tell us why you are a candidate for Port of Seattle Commissioner, what your goals and emphasis for this position will be, and how you plan to accomplish these goals. Oh. Fred. <laughs> Hello. I'm Port of Seattle Commissioner Fred Fellowman. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Third time's the charm, I hope. And we will really wanted to make one quick correction. It's not districted. It's King County wide. 1.4 potential million voters. About half half a million will probably vote. And it's a, a large race. Very few people pay as much attention to it as you do. It's one of the most important positions nobody ever hears of. So thank you for your attention to this. I've been at the airport for seven and a half years but I came following the port since the first cruise ship arrived in 2000. 
my original joke was I've been more port commission meetings than most port commissioners, and now I've just added to that. I came out here in 1980 uh, to actually study killer whales. I did a master's degree in fisheries from the UW. I, I came from Ann Arbor, Michigan before that to get a master's in a bachelor's in uh, psychology, studying animal behavior, but grew up in New York, raised by two parents. Uh, we're, in, we're in teaching uh, business. My dad was a professor of special ed at Brooklyn College. My mom was a special ed teacher, and I have an older brother and sister. My dad passed away. He was a World War II vet, and my mom's 97, living in Florida. And you guys asked the hardest question, so I really appreciate that. So anyway, the um, the reason why am I doing this? To me, it's one of the most exciting opportunities to deal with some of the hardest. Um, well, first of all, the port. I told you it's not very well known, but it is affects everybody's lives. It's generated 121,000 jobs in the region, and it has a tremendous influence on our quality of life. One of the best ways to avoid homelessness is to have a living wage job, and it supports the diversity of the uh, economics of the region. And uh, because it can have from both large union wage jobs that we have a billion dollars a year spent at the airport to small and minority-owned businesses. Anyway, I'm guided by three principles, commerce, community, and climate, and I hope that I have a chance to talk to you more about all of it. Thank you. Your turn, Jesse. Quartz. Hi, folks. Uh, I'm so honored to be standing in front of you speaking today. And you know why? This is my first in-person meeting. <laughs> it's time to get out of the Zoom meeting. Okay, anyway, my name is Jesse Tam. I'm running for Policy Area Commissioner, position five. I came to King County, 1980, same time, 40 years ago. And along the way, I became a banker in downtown Seattle, working for a bank like Rainier, Seacrest, B of A. Not a different bank, they just changing name faster than I could follow. <laughs> so, but I decided to form my own community banks. I served as a CEO for about 12 years. We made millions of dollars of loan financing minorities, women, small businesses to create jobs. Because job is so important. Now you gotta understand, I came from a very humble background. Because I was asked, why do you be a banker who support jobs or labor unions? Well, the fact is, I came to this country $300 in my pocket as a teenager. I worked very hard to get my education. I took care of my family. I took care of a lot of people, businesses, as well as community I served with the district governor for Rotary International. The only Asians and the, only and the last uh, Asian American district governor in the District 503 for 38 years. I also served as a mentor for Seattle U for 32 years. I love working with young people. My reason to run is very simple, very straightforward. Economics, economy, economy jobs, uh, transparency, fiscal responsibility, and last but not least, we have money to take care of the social responsibility. Thank you. Now, the questions with the one-minute answers. How do you define your authority as a commissioner in a relationship to the authority of the executive director of the Port of Seattle? And we'll swap this out and start with you, Jesse. My pleasure. I served as a bank CEO, so I work with the board of directors. I totally understand the relationship. The commission is like a board of directors overseeing the executive director. It's about not uh, managing um, on a day-to-day -day operation, but do ask the right questions. Because we represent the people, we work for the people, we want to make sure the management of the port, running the port like it should be, and if we don't understand it, we ask questions. By doing so, communication, board engagement, workers' engagement, connected in one organization, then we can function efficiently like a real operating organization. 
and charging forward and not to keep asking each other, whose fault was that? <laughs> Transparency is so important for us. Thank you. Thank you for that question. The um, board is like, the commission is like a board of directors, but one difference is we make one hire, and that is the executive. So in fact, we, the, the executive is actually, you know, the order of things is, it's the voters, it's the commission, it's the executive, right? So you, you hire us, we hire the executive. And one of the great things, the opportunity I had was to be involved with firing the last executive and hiring the current guy who I worked with for a decade, who was the captain of the port of the Coast Guard, in um, three years or so before I got on the commission. So the, the um, Steve Metric is a CEO, of, uh, was the uh, CFA really of the um, CFO of the Coast Guard. So he was also a public servant as well as a financial manager. And what we did, Courtney Gregoire and I, we basically changed the title from CEO to C to executive director so that we made it clear that we were looking for a public servant who had business savvy but was not just a corporate executive. So watching out for the public interest so we can do good, to do well, to do good. Thank you. Studies show that airport and marine operations, including those of contractors, adversely impact the health and environment of people living near port facilities. How can these impacts of noise, traffic, serious health hazards be reduced? Well, I thought I'd just turn off. It's a major reason why I came to the port. Commerce, community, and climate to coexist. A great challenge. If we're going to have this economic engine, we deal with the hardest things to decarbonize, ships, planes, and trucks. They all also happen to occur in our neighborhoods. So when you have the fastest growing airport in the country, the 13th largest, it's great for the region, but the communities next door take the brunt of the burden. Similarly, we have the seaport, very productive place, but the neighbors have the brunt of the burden. So it's crystal clear to me that you can get all the permits you want to do business, but the most important permit you get is the social license to do business, especially in a growing city that is encroaching upon the port every day. So if we want to protect industrial lands, the public has to get it, why we have industrial lands. So we've done all sorts of things from uh, insulating homes and putting HEPA filters in schools around the airport to electrifying the waterfront and switching to lower carbon fuels that both improve the air quality as well as the uh, carbon emissions. Thanks. Jesse. Uh, most of you have been around for a long time. <laughs> Just a joke. Um, you know the port issues have been around for a long time as well, for decades. You heard about a lot of speech for politicians, candidates talk about cleaning up our environment, the noise issues, the air pollution issues. Well, somehow, about a month ago, we had a class action lawsuit just filed in South King County for the same issues again. Why are we not taking care of the issues? Now we have to readdress the same issues over and over again. Well, let's be realistic. It's time to do some real things about the real problem for the real people. So, if I'm going to be a commissioner, I want to talk to those people who are literally living there on a regular basis so we can file the issues and deal with that so we can solve the problem once and for all. Not until the class action lawsuit come in, now we have to spend substantial money for it. Thank you. A state-appointed committee charged with finding a location for a new airport failed to reach agreement. None of the designated areas wanted an airport in their backyard. Is it necessary to build a new airport? If so, what's the best way to address the need for additional airport facilities? And if not, what are the alternatives? And Jesse, you get the first shot. Thank you. 2019, we have 51 million people passing through our SeaTac Airport. It down a little bit during the pandemic time. As of this year, 48.9. Guess what? The, what is our capacity for SeaTac? 15 million. That's how close we are hitting the capacity. We need 
some way to increase our airport capacity. To build a brand new airport will take 20 years, and nobody wants to be in the backyard. So my solution for that is let's utilize all the airport facility we have up and down the coast right now. Some of the number are very close, but a few minutes away, the King County Airport, Plainfield, and many others, cargo can move to Moses Lake. There's so many ways we can use technology today to manage the people for transfer and separate the passengers and the cargo shipment. By doing so, we have a better city to live. Stay away from the traffic jam. <laughs> Thank you. Well, one, of the, one of the benefits of being on the commission for seven and a half years is you get to understand how these things work. Airplanes, about half as much of the cargo that you get from pure cargo comes in the belly of the airplane. So you can't detach the two from together. You need to have an airport that has connection to the Kent Valley for redistribution of the goods. As far as I'm concerned, these small airports all around the place, the airlines want connecting flights. So you've scattered the stuff all over the place. You don't have any airport that really has the capacity, except for one. But I know I probably won't be alive by the time it's done, but it's the only one that makes sense, and that's JBLM. Because going south, you still have access to Kent Valley. The population is going south. The light rail is going south. The communities are already exposed to the heavy noise of the airplanes. The, 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 the planes can go to Moses Lake, and the, and the uh, military base can stay there. You need to have connecting flights and air cargo capacity in the same place. So in the meantime, CPAC is spending a billion dollars a year to grow in the capacity. And the big question is, are we going to build yet another terminal? It would be a sustainable airport master plan. And you will hear about this coming up before the end of this year. How would you improve the training and apprenticeship programs to attract, attract young people to maritime and airport jobs? And Fred. The, the opportunities that the port creates for employment are enormous, but many people don't know that they exist. So one of the great opportunities is to get the word out and to have kids get exposure to the opportunities that exist. So one of the programs that I'm a big fan of is called Core Plus. Instead of having a shop class, or like we have shop classes, is to get exposure to uh, port-related operations. They have shop, they have a Core Plus for aviation, and they just started one for maritime. So this is one way you take one class, you get a sample of what it is. If you're interested, then you can go on and having a pre-apprentice programs, apprenticeship programs, and as what we're trying to do now is this career-connected learning, right? So when you come out of your apprenticeship, that's, oh, that's great, now what do I do? So we're getting employers to get paid, actually, to take on these interns so that they could then experiment and see how it works for each other. One of the great things about taking a, an, an elective course or an internship is maybe it's not for you, but you at least get to dip your toe in the water and the employer gets to actually meet you. So we're heavily involved with that on various different fronts. Jesse? Education changed my life. I came to the country with no language ability, no ability to get a job, work all kinds of jobs to get myself to colleges. For the past 20 years, on my early years, I went to school every night beyond working full time. 32 years I served as a mentor for Seattle U because I think the young people is our future. Okay? We gotta educate them. But what I learned from the Port of Seattle the past couple of years is all the training program for high school. Hopefully they get out and get a minimum wage job. And you know how expensive today for Seattle and, and greater Seattle area to live on. Most minimum wages do not afford to pay for the rent today. So by doing so, we got to improve our education, utilize our technology company. We have Microsoft, Amazon, and Facebook, and many more here can help to train those people for a higher position, better education. Our port will benefit from that. Thank you. Is the Seattle-Tacoma Port Alliance being underutilized, and what should it do to attract additional business to the port? And Jesse, you can take that. I love this subject. I went on a train mission. Oh, God, I have made about 250 international trips the last 40 years to 60 countries. 
I worked with former governor Gary Law, former governor Mike Lowry, in many ways to promote trade and export. We have to work with international uh, cities and countries to, to maintain our port businesses. Trade is a fundamental part of our port, so we have to continue to expand on that. We cannot sit here in Port of Seattle, downtown, and waiting for the trade and business come to us. We have to reach out and find them and bring them in. And that has been all my whole entire life in the banking world, starting company, creating jobs, creating business opportunity, entrepreneurship is in my DNA. So I'm looking forward to be able to promote the trade, promote the economy, and bring the jobs back to Seattle. Fred. The Northwest Seaport Alliance, it's referred to as, is the joint operating agreement with the Port of Seattle and Port of Tacoma uh, cargo handling equipment, cargo equipment, was formed in 2015. 2016 was the first year it started, so I've been there since its inception. We have several challenges at the uh, Seaport Alliance based on our logistics. One of the greatest challenges is Canada. Canada's federal government gets cargo much better than we do. It costs $300 to $500 more per container to get to Chicago from Vancouver than it does from here. And the fact of the matter is we're really the port of Chicago because about 80% of the goods that land here go to Chicago, where in LA it's the opposite. They have the population base to be the source of consumption. So also, China trade is moving south. So our great advantage of the North Route is becoming uh, diminished and ships are going through the Panama Canal more and the trade, the ports on the East Coast are expanding rapidly. So we have a very big challenge that we're actively working on looking to India as one of the next great markets, but and very importantly, uh, we also have exports. If you have something to export, they have a reason to come in. What is your position on building mixed-use housing near the Seattle sports stadiums? Fred. I thought you were going to ask I thought you were going to ask topical questions. This is the biggest battle there is right now. Um, in fact, City Council is going to make the decision on this next Tuesday. Uh, the mayor has industrial lands policy that currently right now provides additional protection for industrial lands around the arenas, while um, at the same time provides a transitional housing in other parts of the, uh, of, of the city. So what we believe is the case is that you can do more with infill than you can with sprawl into the industrial lands. You don't want people to be exposed to the health issues associated with living next to a big industrial noise and light and uh, air pollution. And the fact is, you're not gonna put housing in places where it doesn't also have you know, schools and restaurants or, and uh, um, you know, grocery stores and other things like that. So the, having a small amount of housing will mean greater congestion for the poor. So what we really, what we really need to do is invest in areas that have housing and protect those areas that can provide free corridors so that we can stay in business and have the living wage jobs, not the mid jobs, living wage jobs associated with the port. Jesse. If I remember your question is. Oh, yes. <laughs> what is your position on building mixed use housing near the Seattle sports stadiums? I was born and raised in a city of 8 million people. Congestion to me was just every daylight with pollution and everything else. Airport and port is, uh, a trading port is practically, you can see each other. Then I moved to Idaho for nine years. <laughs> My high school had more people than the, the city I was living in. The point I'm trying to make is I understand the challenges of you know, the densities, the growth in this region. I also understand how important to balance the commerce. Quality of life is important to all of us. This is why we all live here. But we have to have commerce so we can cover all the expenses so someone can take care of things. Otherwise, it's going to be more tax, more tax, and more tax, you know. And so with that in mind, we got to find some way to balance it. I think we have enough land to satisfy both industrial needs as well as residential housing. Thank you. This will be the last question, and then uh, I will uh, turn to continue doing our closing remarks. 
Um, a recent class action lawsuit against the port argued that the port must address the contamination zone within five miles of the airport and not expand airport activity that would eliminate over a hundred trees that are now in the zone. Do you agree? Jesse? Do I agree to cut the tree or to save the tree? Oh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay, here we go again. A recent class action lawsuit against the port argues that the port must address the contamination zone within five miles of the airport and not expand airport activity that would eliminate over a hundred trees that are now in the zone. Do you agree? Well, we all know that, how important the trees are to us. But to start growing trees will take 20 years. Okay? So let's preserve the trees to start out with. The fact is, the airport was built many, many years ago, not today or last year. The airport been around with no room to grow. Okay? Very limited capacity, with residents totally surrounding the airport very tightly. Now we've got to use our intelligence. How do we maximize what we have? I've talked about that how to distribute our airport transportation to other locations will help a lot. Minimize the traffic jam and minimize the pollution. The fact is, the port has not been doing well enough. This is why we have a class action lawsuit. Let's not use the each let's not use the lawsuit to solve problems. Lawsuit doesn't solve problems. Lawsuit costs money. Let's talk to each other and figure out what the best way to do. It's complicated, but we can solve it. SeaTac was developed to build to handle 30 million passengers. It's operating closer to 50 million passengers. So if you bought property there in your lifetime, things have gotten pretty miserable. And so you could imagine people are very upset and looking for somebody to blame. The fact of the matter is this case is, is based on the similar case of the cigarette lawsuit that they you know, built a, uh, a defective product. Right? So the cigarette manufacturers knew it was a defective product. They kept on selling it, therefore, that's how Chris Gregoire and others won this wonderful case. We don't make airplanes. We don't make fuel. There's nothing we do that's illegal. But we, I don't deny that we have impacts. But the, our activities itself are not, we don't make cigarettes. Right? So the, the lawsuit is a good public elevation awareness issue. It's important that we, as public officials, you know, I'm with you, now make me do it. If, you know, as a PR thing, I think it's good but it doesn't have legs. However, I understand the concern. And now it's time for your closing statements. Three minutes, and Jesse, you go first. I, uh, I spent my whole entire life prepared for the job. Literally. Why? I have the experiences of working, live in a big city, which I understand commerce, finance, trade, airport. When I was a young person, I used to use my pocket change to take my uh, ticket bus, which I was riding a lot of buses for all those years. From my high school, middle school, to the airport, just sit there and look at all the international commerce going on. Fascinating. This is why I'm here today talking to you, running for port commissioners. I'm also preparing myself totally in this country, education and my career, to learn everything I have to learn, I had to learn, to become who I am today. I wasn't born to know that. I did not have a parents around to teach me, mentoring me, guiding me. In fact, they die young because of cancer, pollution. Environment issues is to my heart. I care about that. I came to the country with no money, $300 in my pocket, and I built a pretty good life. I could have retired by now, traveling, enjoying all the wonderful city in Mexico and Europe, but I want to do something about the port, because the port for decades have been having a lot of financial issues, most recently, even with engineering issues. The airplane can't park at the new terminal. Some of you heard that. Can you imagine that? Four out of the 20 airplanes could not park there. Raw measurement. Okay? We can't afford to have that kind of mistake. Those are hundreds of million dollars of mistakes. 
and lawsuits still going on. If you don't you not know anything about the lawsuit, because we have transparency issues, we need to deal with that. We need to talk to the people because Port of Seattle is a public entity managing the public money, which is your money, my money. I want to make sure I don't have to pay many more tax. I want to make sure my kids work very hard, own their own home, don't have to pay all the money they earn for tax. By doing so, we have to educate the people, making more money, keep working hard to create job opportunities to maintain our economy going forward. We are not going to get fiscal money, uh, uh, federal money, rescue money from federal government. If you know about the national debt in this country, $32 trillion. With that kind of debt in the federal level, there's no money come down. So let's not count on the federal money. Count on us to take care of our own economy. I'm honored to be endorsed by ATU 587, former Governor Gary Locke, uh, John, uh, John uh, Wilson, King County Assessors, couple of senators and representatives. Thank you very much. And now for Thank you. Takes a second. Thanks again for this opportunity. I really do appreciate the chance to share a little bit about the port, hear some of your concerns, and really do feel that this is the culmination of my life's work. It's one thing to have desires to get things done, it's the other thing to know how to get things done. It's the most diverse port in the country. Most ports don't have an airport and a seaport. You can have a whole commission just on an airport, no less the fastest growing airport. We have the uh, home port for the Alaska fishing fleet, as well as the Alaska cruise lines. We have the second largest property holdings in the city. And we have a half dozen recreational marinas. So with this scope of a pallet of work, it takes a long time just to get your head around it, no less knowing how to provide the policy direction that allows for the public interest to be represented on the commission and then ultimately at the organization. So I feel very much I've been a student of the port long before I got to the port. Right now I am the longest serving port commissioner. None of the existing commissioners started with, I started with are still on the commission. And it's a young group of highly intelligent, ambitious people. And there may not be the same group left by the time I'm done with my next term, if I am so lucky to be able to serve there. So institutional memory is pretty critical at this time. And I feel this is the best way in which I can take the input from the public and put it to work. That's the primary thing. You can learn a lot more about what I've been doing and what I hope to do in the future at fredreport.com. And outside, there's uh, some literature of mine. You can see the list of my endorsements are extensive, and including the governor, Hillary Franz, Bob Ferguson, as well as Tang labor unions, and various other elected officials. It's because I have a track record. It's something you can talk about and aspirations, but when you actually put the foot to the metal and you see what you can get done, then people can say, I can trust you. I feel very much uh, fortunate to be able to have this opportunity. I see the next four years as being a particularly exciting point of time to want to put me through this election process, which is a very different style of things than being a candidate and being a commissioner, are two very different things, and uh, different skill sets associated with these things. But the next four years, we're going to have unprecedented levels of state and federal funding for decarbonization, specifically of port-related operations. They finally get it. We have the heaviest, longest, durable instruments burning fossil fuels, the hardest to decarbonize. And this will be a unique opportunity to clean up the air for the communities around the airport, as well as for the climate. We are a significant source of economic uh, engine for the region. We are also a significant source of climate and community impacts. Having commerce, community, and climate through and through, from what I know, you also have to know the regulatory environment in which you work, and that's been my experience throughout my career. Thank you for your attention, and I hope to see you again soon. I thank you both for coming in.
yet critical time. But by the way, before you leave, there's also a King County Veterans, Seniors, and Human Services renewal levy on the ballot. You should have received a copy of that uh, in your cubby. Last but not least, I want to thank all those people behind the scenes, the staff and residents who made this event possible. Risa Ransom. Arthur Brown, the setup crew, and residents Carrie Krensky, who time and time again is willing to be our video. I also want to thank Doris and Adele, who are our timers, they do a ma magnificent job. Thank you also to our election form committee chair, Laura Weiss, and to the other committee members who have worked behind the scenes to make this e evening possible. By the way, one last thing. Be sure and mail in your ballot by August 1st. The next election form will be prior to the general election. So this is it, prior to the primary. Thank you to all of you for coming, and good night.